Welcome to HealthCast. I'm your host, Adam Patterson. We are joined today by Danny Abrahamson and Eli Kaufman, founders of the Mobile Prosthetic and Orthotic Care, or MOPOC program, at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Started originally as a pilot at the VA's Puget Sound Medical Center, MOPOC was founded to provide prosthetics design and support for veterans who might have had difficulty leaving their place of residence, particularly if they live in more remote locations. Having expanded considerably over the past year, MOPOC is now a fully integrated program within the VA's Office of Rural Health that serves multiple locations across the U.S. Having laid the groundwork for MOPOC's expansion, Eli and Danny are now looking to provide an even greater scope of services atop the mobile outpatient clinics that MOPOC has that are used to provide prosthetic services to veterans who may have previously been unable to access this kind of life-changing care. Danny and Eli, welcome to the program. Thanks for having us here, Adam. I just want to say it's great to have both of you on the program because I had the good fortune of speaking with Eli about a year and change ago when Mopoc was really starting to get some serious mobilization. And near the end of the interview, Eli had mentioned that, well, he wasn't able to clearly disclose everything at this time for us to keep an eye out for future developments for Mopoc because there is some slated expansion that was going to roll out within the next year. And looking back, things clearly have expanded considerably. We've seen a nationwide rollout. And so in light of that, in light of all this happened, in light of all that fulfillment, it's just wonderful to have you both on the program now. Uh, thank you very much, Adam. We're, we're excited to be here and I feel uh, lucky to have joined you in, in this podcast. Absolutely, and likewise. And I just want to start out with, again, kind of a preliminary question about yourselves and your research and career interests. So as some general background for our audience, what um, background and career interests brought you to VHA and brought you to working on MOPOC? I, I've kind of had a, a circuitous path that brought me to VA. I, I had a, a, an earlier career repairing musical instruments, which, which in part uh, helped me learn that I, I love working with my hands. And, uh, and that, was, that was a fabulous thing to learn about myself. But I also learned that it's great to work with, with things, but I really, really need more uh, in, in terms of being able to help people. And, uh, and uh, in my 30s, I came across the, uh, the whole field of prosthetics and orthotics, something that I really knew almost nothing about prior to that. Uh, I had a friend that was studying physical therapy, uh, one of the the kind of sister professions to prosthetics and orthotics. Um, and she turned me on to this field and I came to, to check it out and, and fell in love immediately. And after doing uh, all the academic components of the, uh, of the field, I, I then came to do a residency here at the, at the VA where I met Danny, who at the time was my, my director. And the VA has been a fabulous place for me, uh, in part because uh, I mean, one thing it's very, it's, it's close to my heart. I have uh, an uncle and my, my grandfather were both veterans and, and received care at the VA. And it's just, it's a wonderful place to work with so many great programs. And, and really as, as a clinician allows us to provide phenomenal care to the patients that we see. Well, I think uh, my story is similar to, to Eli's um, in that what brought me into the field of prosthetics and orthotics um, was this blend to uh, both uh, be a, a creator and maker, but um, not just uh, have things in front of me, but also work with people. Um, I had completed an undergrad degree in psych and also had this uh, business on the side where I was making jewelry and uh, looking to sort of blend the two and um, stumbled across the field of prosthetics and orthotics, which you might not see it sort of on, on the surface as being similar, but yeah, working with people and, and helping them move through challenging uh, phases in their life and also uh, creating things. And it, it was the perfect blend. So I've been doing uh, prosthetics and orthotics for um, I think about 22 years now. So I've had a fairly long and fabulous career. I worked in the private sector. I've um, done training at Children's Hospital. I, I worked in academia for 11 years, um, taught prosthetics and orthotics, uh, did research um, looking into the um, effectiveness of new components that come out on the market, um, practice clinically, uh, then, then was sort of drawn to, uh, to do something different in, in my career. Um, and about eight years ago, came to the VA because I really loved the fact that um, we could provide what I believed was the, the best patient care. I, interestingly enough, I, I didn't have 
this strong calling to, to serve veterans in particular. It was more of the healthcare model that really drew me in, that there was no barriers around um, insurance companies putting the brakes on, on the sort of care that we could provide. And um, what has been magical is that really the, the draw to serve veterans has, has grown over the eight years that I've been here. And um, I really consider the patient population veterans the most important part of my job and the most exciting. So, um, you know, it was like this lucky benefit that I get to work with this great group of people who are, who are veterans that I really didn't expect to be able to work for. So, Yeah, and it sounds like that human impact is, is really one of the most fulfilling parts. You get to see your work impact and improve and benefit so many lives, and VA is clearly a really ideal place for that by the sound of it. Absolutely. You know, our, um, our successes are very evident when um, what we help people um, work through and the devices that we make for them. Of course, then our failures are also just as obvious when what we create doesn't work. And, and I think that's nice. You know, there's not, not a lot of uh, gray areas there and you know what job you have to do. And it's fun to work through the process of doing it because it's, it's never the same. You know, you'd think that making a, a leg or an arm for somebody would be the same, but it's not everybody has unique needs. Um, they have unique complex um, challenges that brought them to the place where they need our services and um, unique solutions to move them beyond. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, to get down to Mopoc, to where, uh, to where the, the magic is really made, I'm curious, when was Mopoc originally launched as a pilot and what was its founding goal as a project? Because it started from, I guess you could say humble origins before uh, it came to where it is today, but it's clearly expanded a lot in the interim. You know, we, we started talking about this idea of providing mobile care, oh, maybe in 2015 or 2016. Uh, so it, it was quite a while ago while I was still a resident and it involved uh, Danny and I, uh, it was really, it was so simple and it was so, um, it may be naively simple, uh, I, I think, perhaps at the time to, to think uh, that that we just observed, we had patients that were coming in that were just struggling to come in to receive their care. The the anecdote I, I, I cite, and, and it's because this is what, what we really saw, was that we had these partially finished prosthetic limbs that were sitting on our back shelves waiting to be delivered, and months and months were going by, and often it was a patient, uh, you know, they they schedule their appointment and then they couldn't make it in. And it really, and it, we then kind of reached out and started having conversations with these veterans. And, uh, and what we found is that there, there really wasn't a single reason. We, it was, uh, they did more or less all have mobility disabilities, but then there was always something else, some other compelling reason why, why folks just like couldn't get across the line and come into our facilities. Often it was, it was that, that instance of, of the person who has severe PTSD and, you know, dealing with Seattle traffic was just going to you know, push all the triggers. And, um, and that was just more than he could bear in, in coming in. We could, I could, I could name a number of different uh, instances where, where, where patients just found totally new barriers to, to, to just coming in. So it really seemed like a simple solution. Well, if we just go to them, Maybe we can knock down that barrier and, and start providing the care that we know we we know was needed. And so it was in uh, 2018 that we uh, submitted an application to uh, INET, the Innovators Network, to pilot this idea, and we were selected uh, to, as a seed program. So we received some a modest amount of funding so that I could go out one day per week and and see patients uh, remotely. And at the time we were doing all home-based care. And so this was, it was actually pretty an immediate success uh, by all the metrics that we had defined for ourselves. We were not terribly surprised to find that it really does impact the access to care. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. We also though did, uh, we did cost analyses and found that, well, we, we can save a lot of money if we we can save the VA quite a lot of money if we do care this way rather than, say, sending patients to uh, care providers in the community. And so it really wasn't, I mean, it's always interesting to, to mention that, although it, it, it never has been the, the main impetus for, for providing care in this manner. You know, Matt, you, you asked us what, what our initial goals were, and to reiterate what Eli said, uh, you know, it, it started off very simply. We had, a number, I had, I had uh, five or six prostheses, uh, sitting on my shelf that, that uh, were not, uh, I wasn't able to deliver to veterans or their various stages of completion. And 
for, for me, it was such an unusual event. Like I, I had worked in, like I mentioned earlier, in the private sector before, and nobody had ever not shown up for a prosthetic appointment before. I was like, wow, this is weird. Like, you know, when, when you are missing a limb and you need a prosthesis, you don't not show up for your appointment. Like people make every effort. And, and so um, I really had to scratch my head a bit and say, well, what's going on for, for our veterans that, that they're not able to make it in? And then, of course, you know, you start to think about the, the model of care that's established within the VA. And there's not that many service centers, you know, if you, service centers is probably the, the wrong wording. Maybe, you know, the, these are medical centers um, that provide services to veterans, and, and they're usually in large metropolitan areas. So you have, you know, a, a center that's far away that you, you go to for care that, that houses a, a set of expert experts in, in different content areas. For us, it's prosthetics and orthotics. For, you know, for other people, it might be vascular surgery or podiatry. But, uh, it's pretty burdensome to to have to have to fight traffic and get into the city and then of course you know our veterans especially our combat veterans they have a lot going on for them um it's not it's not simple you know losing a limb in combat or losing a limb um post combat because of disease your life is complex and uh it became clear to me that as i began to talk to our veterans more deeply about why it was that they weren't able to come to our appointments um, that, that we really needed to do something different about it. Now you think about um, what it's like to get up in the morning and get ready to go to, to work, for example, if you have to travel and if maybe you have children and maybe you've got a dog, you know, you got to take your dog for a walk. <laughs> you got to get your kids up and get them ready for school. And then um, now like add to that, you're missing a leg. So you have to like use crutches to get around or a wheelchair to get bathed and you have to put a leg on like that one layer of complexity makes it hard. And then you hit traffic coming into a city um, that you're that's foreign and, and, and it's far away. And, and and then you have to fight for a parking spot like it can be easy to say, oh, I just just can't make it today. And, and that was happening because of these layers and layers of complexity that, that make it hard for people to come to medical appointments. Yeah, I remember distinctly. I, I saw both you, Danny, and Eli present at VHA IEX back in 2019, and I was struck by the the origin story. What really brought you to the table with uh, Mopoc? It was this really this real serious impetus to bring care and prosthetics uh, treatment or prosthetics uh, creation to veterans that would have had difficulty accessing it. It sounds like it tied into a part, obviously, with uh, rural care and remote care, but also a good degree of, as you mentioned, sensitivity to patients with particularly serious PTSD for whom travel might be difficult. It sounds like it really merged the, the technical with the human in a really deep uh, and important way. And I was really touched by that. And something I want to ask too, is kind of a follow-up to that is, how did uh, Mopoc first catch the eye of VHA leadership? What really uh, seemed to give you folks that boost? And when were plans made to take the pilot nationwide? Because it has expanded nationwide, not just from Puget Sound, but it sounds like across the country at this point. Like I mentioned earlier, we received our first funding through the Innovators Network, which is housed under the Innovation Ecosystem. And they run this most wonderful program that is really geared toward taking frontline workers like Danny and myself, who have an idea for something that maybe is not already happening at the VA, but could be and perhaps should be. And what they do is they spend a year with selected programs, and they help to mature the, uh, the, the concept and to uh, build a business model and, and, to, and to mentor and coach the individuals who typically have clinical backgrounds or, or some administrative background, but not really the type of background that you would need if, say, you wanted to do a startup business, which is, which is in many ways what this has become so it helps to, to develop the, those skill sets and the knowledge and, um, and, and all the background information that is really required to do that while still promoting your, your program. And, the, and, and, a, and a significant piece of what they offer is so wonderful is, is the opportunity to, to uh, present your work in front of VA leaders and to share your, your, uh, your ideas and to promote opportunities to do just that. And so... I think that uh, Danny and I were able to share locally with our leadership 
at a, num a number of points uh, during our pilot phase, but then in particular, I believe it was the event that you cited just a moment ago, the uh, BHA Innovation, the IEX event in 2019, where Danny and I co-presented on our, our first year's work and, uh, and were really well received. And, and, uh, and it was wonderful that quite a lot of people from the VA reached out to us having seen our presentation. And, and so that, that enabled us to really expand our reach of, uh, of awareness. I, I think it was maybe at, at around that time that we conceptualized taking the plan nationwide. But, but in fact, in my own mind, I, I think from day one, it had always been my dream that this would be something, a, a program that was just not limited to to our small domain here in Seattle. I, I, know, I know personally people that live in other areas of the country that are facing the same sets of challenges. And it was really important to me that, that the work we did wasn't done just for our local veterans. As much as, I, as, much as I, my heart is really connected to those veterans, I, I really felt that the need was, was quite, quite a bit broader than that. And, and as, as it's turned out, and not surprisingly, uh, I, I think, you know, of course, we, we've made a lot of assumptions along the way, and some of them have, have not proved out. But that's one that is proving out, that, that there is a need in, in far more areas of the country than, than, of course, just here in the Northwest. Oh, wow. Well, you know, I agree with everything that you said, Eli, and that I, I would add to it that we were we were lucky enough to um, have a fabulous mentor um, in Dr. Jeffrey Heckman, who's a, a PM&R physician who specializes in caring for people who have amputations. And, um, you know, and he opened a lot of doors for us also. And, and he also sort of push this mantra of like somebody asks you something, the answer is always yes. It's, it's, we, we, all, we always say yes and we always try and try and do it. So you know we I toss out these ideas, you know, you think we should try and uh, push this program. And, and before you could even finish your sentence, you know, Dr. Eggman saying yes, 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 you know, absolutely. And um, he's also very well known with within the VA for being an advocate for veterans and for being innovative. And so as, as being part of, part of our team early on, just his presence opened a lot of doors. He'd say, hey, you know, you should go and talk to your local hospital leadership about this. And he would bring us along. And, and, and so we would get uh, noticed there. And then, they, then it would sort of then get moved on by, by word of mouth uh, through, the, through the VA network. As, as different people hear, heard, heard about our, our program, they, they would move it uh, up the leadership chain. And it just felt, felt so good, you know, that... We hear bad things about the VA. I haven't experienced them. I've only experienced amazing providers and um, amazing administrators who are just here to support the mission. You know, we, I think people have a lot of preconceived ideas about about what the VA is like, but maybe have never experienced it. Um, so I, I feel that um, we, we've really been supported in this journey, and that um, it's really been quite easy. It wasn't wasn't like we had to pound down indoors to get uh, support and funding and um, mentorship um, to, to move this idea forward. You know, there's, it's really been, sure, absolutely, we can help you. Like Dr. Heckman, everybody else that we have encountered has uh, given us support and said yes every time we've asked for something. Yeah, and that kind of support is so essential that I see that your program has been recognized and is receiving that really big structural institutional support that VA is capable of providing. As a side note, I'm curious, what specific VA centers or regions have rolled out or are using the MOPOC uh, program at this point? Also, I still think of us as being brand new, even though we've been doing this for a while. Right In, in, in March, we officially went from mobile ops to MOPOC. Mobile ops was our, our sort of pilot uh, name. We moved into mobile prosthetic orthotic care. And um, that, that, that that time frame, what began in March was that we got funding from the Office of Rural Health um, to begin an enterprise-wide initiative. Um, like you were saying, Adam, an enterprise-wide initiative is, a, is across the, the VA being the enterprise. And so um, you know, this year we've opened up uh, our site in Seattle, another one a little further south in, um, at the American Lake VA, which is uh, right near Tacoma in Washington. We're um, also opening up a site. We're in the process of recruiting now to, to pull a clinician into uh, White City in Oregon. Um, so in, in Southern Oregon, right near the border with California, 
we, we're also um, in the process now of, of recruiting and, and setting up for a spot in Grand Junction, Colorado. So that's Western Colorado and um, also in Grand Island, Nebraska. So places that maybe people haven't heard about because they're a little bit more rural, but um, there are centers that have uh, VA care and um, we'll be providing mobile care in, in the next few months as, as we get set up in those locations. Absolutely. And it's clearly going to make a difference in a lot of lives and an increasing number of veterans who are able to enjoy these services and really benefit from them as it goes nationwide. Roughly speaking, off the top of your head, I know it, it's more of a statistical question, but about how many veterans have received care through a mobile ops and now Mopoc since the start of uh, the pilot? Well, it's uh, so as Danny had mentioned, we have spent the bulk of this year just as, just getting set up, uh, recruiting and filling positions. And so we've had a fairly short period of time uh, during which we've provided actual care. I think if, if I was going to put numbers out, and these are uh, very rough, we're, we've um, conducted in the neighborhood of two, or at the, at the close of the fiscal year, which was uh, in uh, the beginning of October, we had uh, had about 200 patient encounters for, for the year. And most of that happened uh, in the last three months. So, um, and, and, and that is, you know, bear, bearing in mind, there's, a, there's many factors that, that affect uh, how many encounters we uh, are able to conduct day to day and week to week. Um, we have one of our clinicians is new to the VA and so has had to undergo quite a lot of training just, just to get up to uh, a baseline uh, knowledge of, uh, to be able to provide care in the first place. And so, you know, we will, uh, in the coming year, our, the numbers, of course, will climb considerably and, and we expect to be helping in the well, in, in by the low thousands uh, by the you know by the end of next fiscal year. Yeah, if you'll pardon the phrase, it sounds like things have mobilized very quickly. The, the <laughs> fact that this has occurred, most of these encounters have occurred just in the past three months after the I guess you could say the infrastructural enterprise baseline has been established. The fact you're able to roll out that quickly is an incredibly promising sign. Again, and it speaks to why VA has put so much faith in Mopoc. No pressure, of course. So. I, I want to get to, I guess, a bit more of a, a conceptual forward-looking question, because again, it, clearly there's been a lot of development in the past year, but it looks like a lot of that is also very foundational. Like it's almost like a foundation for even further growth uh, and expansion in the program's success and reach. And again, with Mopoc having expanded considerably since its days as, as, a, as a glimmer in both of your eyes, how do you see the program developing further in the near future, whether in terms of, say, the range of services offered or um, the geographic and, and national reach of the program itself? Yeah, you know, I, this, this is a, a, a fairly common question that we get. Um, and, and I think uh, it is more and more becoming obvious to us that the Veterans that we serve with uh, mobility, disability, um, their needs for mobile services are not unique to just prosthetics and orthotics. So I really believe it'd be fabulous if we could take this model of providing care um, both at, at CBOX and veterans' homes and expand it. Now, you know, we sort of leapfrogged off of the backbone of home-based primary care which in uh, special instances provides care for veterans in their home who, who can't come into um, VA medical centers. We've expanded that a bit and, and as a specialty service, prosthetics and orthotics, we're doing things a little bit differently because you know, we, we have a special physical tool set that we need um, to bring with us to be able to uh, be makers in, in what we do. Um, and I think that's often the barrier, like how, how can we expand this to one thing that's come up um, is like radiology. When I talk to the CBOX, they say, you know, one thing that would be really helpful is if we could do x-rays quickly and easily at our CBOX so that we don't have to have people wait or drive long distances, right? The last thing you want to do if you suspect you've broken a bone is come into a place and they get referred and set up for an appointment three days later. Or maybe you have possible pneumonia and you need a chest x-ray. So I, I think I'm um, trying to figure out how we can take our existing framework for providing care based out of CBOX and expand the services there without placing a lot of burden on those CBOX. Um, because one of the things that's important to understand is that these small clinics in, in rural communities, they don't have a lot of space. They don't have a lot of support um, staff there. You know, sometimes they just have three, three or four um, patient rooms and maybe one provider. 
um, who's who's very busy, and that we don't want to be a burden. We want to we want to help them when we when we go go to see box. Um, and so so thinking about how we can work with their existing systems and um, add additional services has been something that we're very interested in. And then that's one area. There's another area um, that Eli is particularly interested in. Um, that I'll, I'll pass the mic back to him to let him talk about that. I, now I'm wondering which area you're thinking of. I, I, I have a three or four in mind right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was thinking about when you were talking about Guam and um, uh, rural Alaska and so, some, of, some of your thoughts around how we can innovate there. So, yeah, uh, yeah, I, th I think I can attempt to tie this all into a, a nice little package, at least something that's digestible. And, and what Danny's referring to here is, I, I think maybe it's that we... Uh, to meet the needs of, of the patients in, in the areas that with which we're, we're familiar. And for so much of the, the continental United States, we, we know that we can do this work in some kind of pre-formatted manner. And that's why we've, we've, we've built out, we've, we've designed a, a vehicle that's uh, purpose-built with the workshop in the back. And we've, and we've created a care model centered around providing care out of the, the community-based outpatient, outpatient clinics and, and uh, inpatient homes at times. But I think what we're finding is, as we then look further and further into new, into new areas is that the circumstances are, are just different enough that what we, have, what we kind of have prepackaged is not going to work, just it's not going to, to fulfill the need. And so uh, Danny mentioned rural Alaska or, or the, uh, the South Pacific Islands, where, you know, obviously we can't drive a van from Hawaii to Guam. Um, and in fact, we can't drive a van to a lot of the Alaskan islands. And, and some of these veterans are so, so incredibly remote that we have to conceptualize new um, different types of tools to, uh, to, to improve their access. And so um, part of that is uh, utilizing digital tools that maybe haven't had a place in prosthetics in the past or, or have had a very limited a limited place in prosthetics or in the VA, and in leveraging those to as best as possible in conjunction with potentially other modes of, of transport to, to be able to see those veterans in the place that really works for them. So I, I, I'd probably leave it at that because because mostly because each situation is just so incredibly specific. And um, and that, that's part of what, what's really exciting to me is, is that there's the, uh, the opportunity to, uh, to both build what we've already started but then also innovate and, and create new solutions to uh, to the, the situations that we encounter. Definitely. It looks like the horizons are, are pretty considerable, both in terms of, as Danny mentioned, the possibility of, for example, bringing other kinds of mobile care like x-rays that are critical for people who are suffering, how do I put this gently, very sudden mobility issues, as well as the possibility of bringing care to those particularly remote, remote areas. You mentioned Guam, for example, in Alaska. And something I want to, a question I want to ask for all of you is, is there anything else before we wrap up here that you would really like our audience to know about Mopoc, both about what it offers and its potential for veterans and just anything else about the program that you think you would really like to get out there? Love that open-ended question. Thank you, Adam. I mean, I, I think I, I want veterans to know that uh, first, you know, we, we really love being your provider of choice. We like working with you and we uh, see Mopoc as one way to help solve the problems that you face when you have prosthetic and orthotic needs. But you know, Eli and I, we're just, we're just two guys um, try, trying to come up with ideas. So if we don't have it quite right, we wanna hear from you. Um, this, is, this is a model that we've developed um, to provide care but it's definitely not perfect. It definitely will need to be adapted to address veterans' needs. So we really welcome your feedback to sort of grow and change and adapt um, as uh, your service needs are, are put forth and um, put in front of us. So, so I think that's, that's the most important thing. And I think, secondly, as a veteran, I want you to know that uh, we as employees of the VA are incredibly well supported. We have lots of um, we have lots of leadership support. We have lots of financial support. So 
if you have needs, um, speak to us because the VA is really an amazing place for us to work. And um, we want to take that workplace that has been created for us and help it to better serve you. Those are probably the, the two most important messages that, that I want to share. I, I might just piggyback off that one comment of yours, Danny, and, and, and just let folks know that we, um, you know, we're, we're, we're working with, uh, with the data that we have available to us to understand where, where patient need is. And, and we're, we're talking to folks around the VA to, to, to get ideas for where to expand. But if, if you think that MOPOC would be a program that could work well wherever it is that you live, we'd like to hear from you. And we'd like to hear from the folks in your prosthetics departments and, and, and veterans that potentially could uh, utilize our services. So please do reach out for us and uh, perhaps we can, I don't know, how can we share, Adam, how do we, how do we share our contact information? What's the, uh, what's the protocol here? I'd be happy to include that when the episode goes live. Okay, very good. If you're comfortable with that, by all means. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, that would be great. Absolutely. And, and that's really what this program is about, helping us spread the word and awareness of these really impactful, you know, health IT or healthcare projects, you know, the likes of Mopoc that show this really incredible promise. So Danny and Eli, you'd mentioned that there was a lot of staff that work with you both at Puget Sound and across Mopoc as a whole that are really instrumental for bringing the program to fruition. And I'm wondering, are there any, any names, any people you'd like to give, uh, you know, a lot of uh, credit to or, or recognize before we wrap up? Oh, thanks for the opportunity, Adam. Um, absolutely. You know, I think Glenn Pigman and, and Nathan Dooley are, are prosthetist orthotists who uh, hop in their vehicles early in the morning and sometimes drive three hours one way to provide veteran care, you know, across the mountain pass. So really, like, they're the guys in the trenches who are really doing the hard work. And, and they, they do this because they love providing care for veterans. And um, you know, it, it's it's hard. It's hard. It's really hard work. You can imagine driving six hours a day and then seeing a bunch of people and having to come back to the lab and do fabrication. So I really just want to give a little shout out to Nathan and Glenn because they work so hard. And then also to Kelsey, our, our program administrator, who, you know, is, is really wonderful in working with our veterans to coordinate care and make sure that uh, Glenn and Nathan and Eli and myself are supported so we can do our do our job. So thank you to all three of you. So again, Danny and Eli, I want to thank you so much for coming onto the program. It was wonderful to have you. Thanks, Adam. It's great to be here today. We really appreciate the opportunity, Adam. Thank you very much. Take care. HealthCast is a production of Government CIO Media and Research. For more podcasts, head to governmentciomedia.com slash podcasts. HealthCast is produced by Amy Kluber, hosted by Melissa Harris and Adam Patterson. If you liked what you heard, let us know by leaving a review in iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening.